Hello and welcome, I am Sir Shudder. Before we begin, if you enjoy my content please like and subscribe and hit the notifications icon to see when I've done another video. By now you've probably realised I'm a prolific Googler and I go to the dark ends of the web to try and find some information that's not only shocking but often true. This tale is not for the faint of hearted so if you have a strong disposition and a really vivid imagination I recommend you don't w listen to this one. But without further ado for those who are staying tuned I'll begin. Timothy Richard McLean Jr. was born in October 3rd 1985 in Victoria British Columbia. He grew up in both in both in Winnipeg and in Ellie, Manitoba. He was 22 years old when he was killed on the July the 30th, 2008. At the time of his death, McLean had been working as a carny, specifically a carnival baker, barker. At 12:01 p.m. on July 30th, 2008, Tim McLean a carnival barker was returning home to Winnipeg after working at a fair in Edmonton. He departed Edmonton on board a Greyhound bus 1170 to Winnipeg via the Yellowhead Highway through Saskatchewan. He sat at the rear on a row of the toilet at 6.55 p.m. The bus departed from a stop in Ericsson, Manitoba with a passenger, Vince Wake Young Lee. Lee, described as a tall man in his 40s with a shaved head and sunglasses, originally sat near the front of the bus but moved to sit next to McLean following a scheduled rest stop. McLean barely acknowledged Lee, then fell asleep against the window pane, headphones covering his ears. According to a witness, McLean was sleeping with his headphones on when the man sitting next to him suddenly produced a large knife and began stabbing him in the neck and chest. After the attack began, the bus driver pulled to the side of the road and he and all the passengers fled the vehicle. The driver and two other men made an attempt to rescue McLean but were chased away by Lee who slashed them from behind and locked the bus doors. Lee ultimately de decapitated McLean and displayed his severed head to those standing outside the bus, then returned to McLean's body and began severing other parts and consuming some of the flesh. At 8.30pm, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Portledge, La, La Prairie, received a report of stabbing on the Greyhound bus west of the city. They arrived to find the suspect still on the bus, being prevented from escaping by another passenger. The bus driver and the, and the truck driver who had provided a crowbar and hammer as weapons. The other passengers were huddled at the roadside, some of them crying and vomiting, as the suspect had earlier attempted to escape by driving the bus away. The driver had engaged the emergency immobiliser system rendering the vehicle in, um, inoperable. Witnesses had observed the suspect stabbing and cutting McLean's body and carrying McLean's severed head. By 9pm the police were in a standoff with the suspect and had sub summoned special negotiators and a highly armed tactical unit, heavily armed tactical unit. The suspect alternatively placed the length of the bus and defiled the corpse. Police officers then observed Lee eating parts of the body. Meanwhile, the stranded passengers were transported from the scene to be interviewed at the Brandon RCMP detachment. RCMP officers reportedly heard Lee say, I have to stay on the bus forever. On July 31, 2008, at 1.30am, the suspect attempted to escape the bus from breaking the window. The RCMP arrested Lee soon afterward. He was shot with a taser twice, handcuffed and placed in the back of the police cruiser. 
Parts of the victim's body placed in plastic bags were retrieved from the bus, while his ear, nose and tongue were found in Lee's pockets. The victim's eyes and a part of his heart were never recovered and are presumed to have been eaten by Lee. At 10am, Greyhound representatives took their, the other passengers to a local store to replace their clothes, which remained on the bus. They arrived at Winnipeg at 3.30pm that day to be reunited with family members and friends. Vincent Weigang Li was born in Dandong, China on April 30th, 1968. In 1992, Li graduated from Wuhan Institute of Technology with a bachelor's degree in computing. From 1994 to 1998, Li worked in Beijing as a computer software engineer. Li immigrated to Canada on June 11, 2001. Through some newspapers, mistakenly reported 2004 and became a Canadian citizen on November 7, 2006. The psychiatrist Stanley Yuren, who later examined Lee, said Lee was hospitalized in 2003 or 2004 after an incident with the Ontario Provincial Police. He worked in Winnipeg as a at mental menial jobs and gr at Grant Memorial Church for six months to support his wife, Anna Pastor, Tom Castor, who employed Lee, said he seemed happy to have a job and was committed to doing it well. Despite a language barrier with other congregation, congregation members, I think he would occasionally feel frustrated with not being able to communicate or understand. Castor told CTV Winnipeg, but we have very patient staff members and he seemed to be to respond well. Castor also said, Lee did not show any signs of anger issues or any other trouble before he quit in the spring of 2005. He worked as a forklift operator in Winnipeg while his wife worked as a waitress. Lee first moved to Edmonton in 2006 abruptly leaving his wife alone in Winnipeg until she joined him later. His jobs included service at Walmart, at a fast food restaurant and newspaper delivery. His delivery boss Vincent Olga described Lee as reliable, hardworking and showing, not showing any signs of trouble. Four weeks before the killing he was fired from Walmart for following a disagreement with other employees. Shortly before the incident, Lee asked for time off from his delivery job to go to Winnipeg for a job interview. At two, July 29th, 2008, at 12.05pm on July 28th in Edmonton, Lee boarded the Greyhound bus for Winnipeg. On, on July 29th, around 6pm, Lee got off the bus in Ekrinson, Manitoba with at least three pieces of luggage and stayed the night on the bench next to the grocery store. According to a one witness, he was sent to, seen at 3 a.m. sitting bolt upright with his eyes wide open on the morning of July 30th. Still at the bench, he sold his laptop computer to a 15-year-old boy for $60. The laptop was seized by the RCMP as evidence the boy was subsequently given a new laptop for his honesty by an anonymous businessman. Witness Garnet Caton said the attacker seemed oblivious to others when he, the stabbing occurred, adding his he was struck by Lee's calm demeanour. There was no rage or anything. He was like a robot stabbing the guy. He said when he appeared in Portage La Prairie, courthouse on charges of second degree murder, the only words Lee reportedly uttered were pleas for someone to kill him. The trial. Lee's trial commenced on March 3rd, 2009, with Lee pleading not criminally responsible on account of mental disorder. This means he accepted the offence occurred but claimed that he was unable to form the necessary mental element or means. Ray. The 
psychiatrist said that Lee performed the attack because God's voice told him McLean was a force of evil and was about to execute him. The pre presiding judge, John Scurfield, accepted the diagnosis and ruled that Lee was not criminal or responsible for the killing. Lee was remanded to Selkirk Mental Health Centre. Aftermath the week following the attack, Rayhound Canada announced it was pulling a series of nationwide advertisements which included the slogan, There's a reason you're never heard of bus rage. The incident has led to numerous calls and petitions demanding increased security on intercity buses. After the incident, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, attempted to run an ad in the Portage Daily Graphic comparing the killing of McLean to the consumption of animals. The paper's publisher refused to run the ad. The family of Tim McLean had brought a lawsuit of $150,000 against Greyhound, the Attorney General of Canada, and Vince Lee. On June 3rd, 2010, Lee was granted supervised outdoor walks with his mental health facility as voted by the Provincial Review Board. On February 16th, 2011, two passengers, Deborah Tucker and Kaylee Shaw, filed a lawsuit against Lee, Greyhound, the RCMP and the Canadian government for being exposed to the beheading. They were each seeking $3 million in damages. On July 14, 2015, the two women dropped their lawsuit. On May 30, 2011, CBC reported that Lee was responding well to his psychiatric treatment and the, that his doctor had recommended that he receive more freedoms, phased in over several months. On May 17, 2012, the National Post reported that Lee had been granted temporary passes that would allow him out of the Selkirk Mental Health Centre for visits to the town of Selkirk, supervised by a nurse and police officer. In an interview, Lee spoke for the first time saying that he began hearing the voice of God in 2004 and that he wanted to save the people from an alien attack. On February 27, 2014, the CBC reported that on March 6, Lee would be allowed to have unsupervised visits to Selkirk, starting at 30 minutes and expanding to full day trips. Since 2013, he had been allowed to have supervised visits to Lockport, Winnipeg and nearby beaches. Those visits were then relaxed. On July 17, 2014, the Toronto Sun reported that one of the first officers on the scene, Corporal, ben, Corporal Ken Barker of the RCMP, had committed suicide. The family stated in his obituary that he was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. On February 27, 2015, CBC News reported that Lee was given unsupervised day passes to visit Winnipeg so long as he carried a functioning cellular phone while using them. On May 8, 2015, CTV, CTV News reported that Lee would be granted passes to group homes in the community. In February 2016, it was reported that Lee had legally changed his name to Will Barker, Baker and was seeking to leave his group home to live independently. He won the right to live alone on February 26th upon the recommendation of the Criminal Code Review Board. On February 10th, 2017, the Manitoba Criminal Code Review Board ordered Lee be discharged. Lee was granted an absolute discharge there will be no legal obligations or restrictions pertaining to Lee's independent living. Well, I think that is a total crock and I think that if you do the time, you do the crime. Mental health, being able to do something like that under the Mental Health Act, they should be locked up, 
permanently because there's also there's another chance that he could snap again and do the same damn thing what a cop out what do you think in my personal opinion the, the law is designed to protect criminals more than it is the victims the victims have to live with the trauma of what's happened to them for the rest of their lives while the criminals get treated to luxury hotel type cells playstations tvs you name it some of them are better off on the inside than they are out which is why they reoffend. and if they keep on getting sentences where they're basically better off than they are on the outside how is that rehabilitating rant over thank you very much for watching and for those who've subscribed i also thank you very much any support is much appreciated i hope that i can continue to provide you with some useful entertainment and also some information you can learn from did you enjoy that? If you did, if you haven't already, please like and subscribe and hit the notifications icon so you can see when I've done another video. And I want you to tell all your friends about me. Until next time, I am Sir Shudder. See you soon. Be safe, be cool.